This is Mike Bradley, Marketing Manager for the FDR Products at Thermo Fisher Scientific. This presentation will introduce the four major sampling techniques used in FTIR. Further presentations will delve into these in much more detail. This presentation is intended just as a general overview. So let's just get started. The first of the four techniques is transmission, in which the IR beam passes through the sample and onto the detector. In attenuated total reflection, the IR beam enters a crystal, interacts with the sample which is on the surface of that crystal, then exits the crystal and passes on to the detector. In diffuse reflectance, the IR beam interacts with a sample which is in a loosely packed powder usually mixed with an inert ingredient such as KBR or diamond powder. In specular reflection, the IR beam passes through a sample which is on the surface of a reflective sample, strikes the reflective surface, and then bounces back through that sample a second time, double passing, and then goes on to the detector. Each of these techniques have their relative strengths and weaknesses for specific sample types, and we'll briefly examine those. Transmission is probably the classic method. In this case, the IR beam passes through the sample compartment. We record a background. Then we introduce a sample into that beam. The sample absorbs some percentage of that beam. The resulting light that goes to the detector is then ratioed to the initial light. That ratio provides something called a percent T, or transmission spectrum. Historically, transmission is the method of choice for many standard operating procedures. It is good for solids, liquids, or gases, for qualitative analysis, or quantitative analysis. Typically, the tools used in transmission are quite low cost, and again, historically, it has been the basis for most spectral libraries. The key point for transmission is that the amount of IR light absorbed is proportional to three things. The absorptivity, called up here symbolized as epsilon, the path length, L, and the concentration, C, of the number of molecules in the beam. The epsilon gives the spectrum its shape, the absorptivity being a function of each wavelength or wave number in the spectrum, and C, the concentration, is where the quantitative information comes from. Attenuated total reflection, or ATR, has grown to become the most popular technique currently used by people in infrared. Solids and liquids can be very easily analyzed. The critical thing here is that the sample must be in contact with the active surface of the crystal, where the IR beam interacts with it. Sample pretreatment, you don't usually need to do anything to your sample in order to be able to use it. If it's a powder, if it's a liquid or a gel, you can get good contact with the surface. You can do ATR. At the heart of the ATR technique is the crystal. The IR beam must pass through the crystal, and the crystal must be in contact with the sample. There are three parameters which define which crystals are used in a given circumstance. One is the spectral range. Over what range does the crystal have a clear window where it's usable? The next is the depth of penetration, which is how far into the sample the IR beam penetrates. And finally, there is the robustness, uh, how the crystal material resists environmental wear. The most popular is diamond. It has a wide spectral range, it has a depth of penetration of about 2 microns, and it is the most robust of the materials. However, it's also the most expensive. Zinc selenide has a very similar depth of penetration, but the crystal is much softer, and therefore it's not nearly as robust, and it has a slightly narrower spectral range. Germanium has the advantage of a very high index of refraction, which gives it a shallow depth of penetration. So for materials which are either highly absorbing or highly scattering, like carbon black rubbers, those materials are very easy to run on germanium, where the spectra on other materials is not so good. There are a number of configurations of attenuated total reflectance accessories. The smart arc is what's called a multi-bounce, which means the IR beam bounces multiple times along the crystal, giving multiple interactions with the sample so that you get a longer path length, in essence. 
The Smart ITX and the Smart Golden Gate are designed to be single bounce, which means you only interact once with the sample. All three of these and most of the other accessories can be configured with different crystals, so you could put germanium, zinc, selenite, or diamond in several of the different accessories. Therefore, you're able to tune or select your depth of penetration, the number of interactions, depending upon the use you're going to have, and also the robustness to choose that so that it resists the environmental conditions that you'll be exposing it to. One of the frequently asked questions about ATR is whether it can be used in quantitative analyses, and the answer generally is yes. If the sample is either a liquid, in which case it makes good contact with the surface just by the nature of being a liquid, or if it's a solid and we can generate re reproducible pressures to interact with that crystal, then the peak height becomes a function only of the concentration of the materials, and you can calibrate the ATR and use it. So it's very good for many quantitative applications. In specular reflectance, the sample is placed on a reflective surface. In the cartoon in the upper right corner, you see the light blue film laid on top of the darker surface. The IR beam then passes down through the film, reflects off the surface, back through the film, and out, interacting with the sample twice. This is a very good technique for thin films, thin layers on surfaces when the surface is reflective. And the IR beam then reports on the bonds which are near that surface to produce the spectrum. Accessories which are used to do specular reflectance tend to consist of a small number of mirrors that direct the beam onto the surface and they collect the scattered light or the reflected light off of that surface and then through to the optics. Some, such as the Smart Sega shown here, also involve the use of a polarizer for reasons that we won't discuss here. The beam can approach at a very grazing angle, which means very steep along the sample, or it could be at a more perpendicular, or closer to perpendicular type of angle. This really depends upon the thickness of the films you're going to be looking at as to which you'd want to use. And here's an application showing why you would use different angles. This is aluminum foil with a thin coating on the surface. If you look at the two spectra shown there, the blue one involved bringing the beam in at near 45 degrees, whereas the red one involved bringing the beam in at about 75 degrees. And you can see the big difference in the signals. The 75 degrees makes for a much more intense signal. This is a very thin film, which is why this works this way. With a thick film, you'd prefer to use the steeper angle because otherwise your signal would be totally absorbing. The last of the four techniques is diffuse reflectance. In this case, the IR beam is directed down onto this powdered sample or this irregularly surfaced sample. The specular component, the light that's just reflected straight off, is actually ignored by the system. It's looking for the light which is scattered in other directions, where the light has penetrated down into the sample, reflected multiple times, passed through particulates of the sample, interacted and been absorbed by those samples, and then being reflected out to the detection optics. Here are two of the accessories used in diffuse reflectance. At the top is the collector 2. You can see the sample there is located at the center beneath that clamshell of those two mirrors on either side. This one is used very successfully in gemstone research where diamonds or other gemstones are placed on that sampling location and the beam passes through them. The bottom one is more of a classical diffuse reflectance type of technique where the beam comes in, reflects off the sample, the beam is collected in a backscatter mode and then sent on to the optics. Now, as I said at the outset, this talk was merely meant to introduce the four sampling techniques. There's a lot more material available in the general introduction to FTIR applications talk that will cover these techniques in more detail, give applications examples, and discuss how the techniques are used. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it, and we hope to see you again here on our webpage. Have a great day.